Hi, uh, I'm Brandon. And I'm Lisa. Uh, we're engineers on the native team at Kickstarter, uh, doing both iOS and Android. Uh, we're a pretty small team of engineers, uh, ranging from junior to senior, and uh, we've been on a journey for the past two years, uh, unifying our foundations across iOS and Android. Uh, for example, I was originally hired as an iOS engineer at Kickstarter, but jumped onto Android when we started working on our 1.0, uh, my esteemed colleague, Lisa, on the other hand, was hired as an Android engineer, but happily started writing Swift when we started on our rewrite and re-architecture. Um, but we always had a few core ideas that we held closely so that we could share knowledge while working on two platforms, even though we couldn't share code. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that there isn't a bit of identity involved. Uh, I would say I primarily identify as an iOS engineer in my day to day. Uh, and Lisa would probably identify as an Android engineer, even though she's given more talks at iOS conferences than Android conferences, and has recently made a guest appearance on Chris and Florian Swift talks. <laughs> uh, so Lisa and I would like to give you a tour of our platforms of choice to show off their strengths and weaknesses, but still hoping to convey that really we're just all doing the same thing uh, if you embrace a few core ideas. So it's worth noting that, in case you don't already know, all of our code is open source on GitHub for iOS and Android apps. So you can go to these links and see how we actually use all of these things that we're going to talk about. So let's start with the language we use for our respective platforms. So everyone here is probably already familiar with Swift, but you may not have heard of Kotlin. And what it is, is it's a JVM language that is built by JetBrains, the makers of Android Studio, the most popular IDE for Android, and also IntelliJ, which is just a great IDE. And we didn't know that they were going to be sponsors of this conference, so if they're here, I want some stickers. <laughs> and its aim is to have 100% interoperability with Java, which is a bit different from Swift. They want all Kotlin code to be reachable from Java. And this is a great thing, but sometimes this holds Kotlin back a little bit. And it has a similar philosophy as Swift in that it's primarily an object-oriented programming language, um, but it has given a few first-class support, first support to a few small features from functional programming. And it's very expressive in some really beautiful ways that we'll get into really soon. Yeah. So. In Swift, one of the nicest features is the optional type. It allows you to express the absence of a value in a type-safe way. So here I have an array of integers. I want to add one to the first element. Uh, and Swift is stopping me from doing this because it cannot know that the array of x's isn't empty. And so I have to handle the case when the x's is empty, which means x's dot first is nil. Yeah, and optionals and null safety are great. Fortunately, Kotlin has made this a first-class concern. And here we see how we have to explicitly tell Kotlin that x can hold a null value using the same notation as in Swift. And in the case of y, Kotlin has prevented us from storing null since we have marked its type as a non-nullable int. We also have an array of integers and the first or null method, which behaves just like Swift's first method. And similarly, Kotlin is preventing us from adding one to an optional integer. OK, that's great. But mm -hmm. an important part of functional programming is structs and enums, also known as product types, sum types, or even product and coproducts if you're going to want to go really deep. But these types express the idea of having many values at once or having the choice of one value from many, many different values. Uh, they're also well suited for immutability and statelessness. Here we have a user struct with three fields, um, bio, ID, name. And we also have an either type that expresses the idea of having either something of type A or either or something of type B. Uh, and we use this a lot in our code bases. Uh, and we've instantiated a few values just to see how they can be used. OK. But over in the Kotlin world, <laughs> structs and enums are called data classes and sealed classes. The data classes have pretty much a similar style to, Swift, to structs in Swift, and they work pretty much the same. The sealed classes are how we achieve enum-like functionality in Kotlin, and they look a bit different. And essentially, we create an uninstantiable type called either, which is the sealed class. And then we have two inner subclasses for modeling the left and the right values. 
It's basically an object-oriented programming way to do enums. But the amazing part is that this is 100% interoperable with Java, so we can use the either type in our Java code, and we do. And whereas in Swift, the either enum is not accessible from Objective-C at all. That's very true. Uh, but uh, this little code snippet is showing off three very important things. Uh, first, we can open up the either type and add functionality to it. We can do that also even if to types we don't control. We can just extend any type and add stuff to it. And here we've added a map method. Uh, it will transform an either AB to an either AC uh, via this F uh, argument. But also functions can take functions as arguments in Swift. So we're allowed to allow map uh, to take this function F from B to C. And then finally, we have switch, which allows us to destructure an enum and look at the left and the right separately while also getting compile time guarantees that we looked at both parts. Because you would never want to look at only the left or only the right. You almost always need to consider both, and you want the compiler to keep you in check. Uh, and so here we've constructed a write value of two, and then we mapped on it, provided a closure, we can even omit the name of the argument of the closure and just use dollar sign zero, and then we squared the integer. OK, that's pretty cool. We can do all of this in Kotlin, too. Um, but first, to extend a type, you can just define a new function on the type itself using dot, which is really neat. Also, functions are supported as values in Kotlin as well, so we can provide the transformation function as an argument to the map, really similar to the slide that we just saw. And this is what's called a higher order function. And finally, we can use when to destructure the either into each of its inner subclasses. With when, we also have compile time safety that we've handled both the left and the right cases. And finally, we can use it much the same way as we did with Swift. The only big difference here is that instead of dollar sign zero, we use the keyword it to express the value within the map. And anything you can do, I can do better. We can write this function as an expression. And we can use the syntax in Kotlin because when is treated as an expression. It can also be a statement. And just to remind everyone, this is, again, fully interoperable with Java. So we can construct either values, call Kotlin functions that accept and return ethers all from Java. OK, that's pretty cool. Um, well, Swift has support for operators, which allows us to write expressive code that have nice algebraic properties. Uh, here we've defined an arrow function. Uh, it is a forward composition for function. So it takes a function from A to B, a function from B to C, and it returns a function from A to C. Um, and just by composing those functions. And so here we define a couple of little functions to play with, an increment function and a square function. Uh, and then we can derive all new functions out of it by just composing in whatever way we want. Uh, we've defined f to be increment, and then square, and then increment. And we can use that f to hand it over to a map function. And the map function is transforming the integers from 1 to 10 to a new array of integers where you just applied f to each of those integers. It's pretty neat. So Kotlin doesn't have support for custom operators, but it does allow for you to define infix functions with this infix notation. So this means you can define a function that takes two arguments, but use it in an infix manner. So for example, here we have defined an and then function that takes a function from type A to B on the left and a function from B to C on the right and returns a function from A to C. This allows us to chain the increment and square functions together in any way you want. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's doing the exact same thing as that forward operator that Brandon just defined. And finally, in a similar manner to Swift, we can feed that function to a map to transform an array of integers to a new array of integers. And here's a cool feature of Kotlin that allows us to specify when a recursive function can take advantage of tail recursion. So recursion is an important part of functional programming because it allows for us to focus on the structure of the data. And let's remind ourselves that a recursive function is said to be tail recursive if the return statement of the function contains only a call to the function itself and nothing else. Such recursive functions can be optimized by unrolling the recursion into a loop. And Kotlin has direct support for this optimization. 
if you can write your recursive function in tail form, you can annotate the function with the tail rec keyword, and Kotlin will optimize the function to be a plain old for loop. It'll even raise a compiler warning if you try to use this modifier on a function that is not properly in tail form. So here I have the sum function that shows how to recursively define the sum of a list of integers as a sum of its head plus its tail. Since it's easy enough to write this in tail form, I can now sum a list of thousands and thousands of integers without worrying about blowing up the stack. That is very nice and is unfortunately quite sad for Swift. We, um, we have no such thing. Uh, you, you could get tail call optimizations, but you actually don't know. So um, in this case, I've defined the exact sum function that Lisa defined, uh, but I could give it maybe about 5,000 or 6,000 numbers, and it would crash. It would blow up the stack. Um, so this is something that Kotlin has that's quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> so in case you haven't already guessed, we like functional programming because it allows for us to leverage functions, immutability, and minimal side effects to write composable and most importantly, testable code. <laughs> if you don't test your code, you're a monster. <laughs> Swift and Kotlin are not functional languages, but they do offer first-class support for many functional features, such as the map and filter operators. And they're really good foundations for building functional frameworks. So here, this is a cool slide. This is the coolest slide. We have two snippets from our open source code base. Um, and we're using Reactive Swift on the left and Rx Java on the right. So this code is run on our thanks screen after you go to Kickstarter and you back a project. And after that, we want to show you three projects, preferably three projects that are recommended for you by our recommendation engine. But in case you don't have enough recommendations, we'll pull three similar projects to the one you just backed. And if there still aren't enough projects, we'll fall back to just some staff curated projects, which will always exist. So usually to get these projects, we would have to perform multiple API requests just to get all these types of projects, concat them together, and then take the first three. But when we're working with signals and observables, the take three you see here on both sides will complete the entire chain, prevent us from doing more API requests than needed. So for example, if the API request for recommended projects returned three or more projects, we wouldn't even execute the other two requests to fetch the other kinds of projects. And this is an example of lazy evaluation, which is a big idea in functional programming, um, which actually saves us from making excess API calls. And the rest of this logic, what it does is it filters out the project you just backed and then ensures that all of the projects are distinct. So it's really cool to see how compl this really complicated logic, just talking through it, um, get a little confused, can be written in nearly an identical way on two very different platforms, two different languages, without even appealing to platform-specific tools like URL session or async task. Hmm. Yeah. This is really fascinating stuff. Um, and I'm kind of starting to think that instead of us saying that anything you can do, I can do better, we should say anything you can do, we, we can, can do, do together. together. <laughs> mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, but yeah, uh, so after two years of developing with a team where everyone is expected to contribute to both iOS and Android at some point, we've come to the conclusion that we want to develop on a foundation of functional programming and then implement that into our respective platforms. Uh, we invest a lot of time experimenting with ideas. Uh, we are quite deep into the world of lenses, which you've maybe heard us talk about before, and that's for working with immutable data, and applicative uh, style of parsing for dealing with like nebulous blobs of data uh, safely, all these things. We want to be able to share these findings with each other regardless of platform. We want to just be like one team of engineers. Um, and further, it, it kind of feels good to wipe away this divide between Android and iOS and kind of get rid of the anything you can do, I can do better attitude. Uh, we, we benefit tremendously from encouraging everyone to be fluent in iOS, Android, Java, Swift, Kotlin, uh, and, some, and sometimes in ways that is not completely obvious. Uh, you know, I, it's certainly true that 
I write more Swift than Java Kotlin these days, but I also review all of Lisa's uh, pull requests, or Android pull requests. So we're able to distribute work and understanding in more like subtle ways than that goes just beyond uh, writing code. Um, yeah. So if you want to find us, these are our Twitter handles. Thank you for Thanks. listening.